Hello to all of our viewers. We are wishing you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we hope you enjoyed these classic episodes we are re-releasing during this holiday season while we're all spending time with our families. Blessings and love from Melody and Dunnigan Kaiser to you. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're very privileged to have this returning guest. This is only the second time we've had Joel Skousen on our channel, but we're glad to have him back. Joel, thank you for joining us on Reluctant Preppers. It's good to be with you. I had an excellent response from our last interview. Uh, Joel is the editor of the World Affairs Brief. He's also an expert on high security architecture and also talking to us today about solar self-sufficiency. Joel, last time we had you on, we, we addressed the topics of strategic relocation and uh, also defensive architecture. And today, if you could take us deeper in the, in the realm of defensive architecture, uh, but specifically talking about um, high security provisions that people should consider if they really want to make sure that uh, they're addressing the, their proximity, their, their home, and where they're maybe storing some of their, their vital supplies, that sort of thing. Well, first of all, let's take a look at the big picture once again, kind of as a review for those that didn't uh, uh, catch our first interview. We spent a lot of time talking about the strategic threat situation in the world, especially the prospect of uh, an eventual World War III with Russia and China and what that may in, entail with the United States, especially if they use a preemptive uh, uh, EMP strike on the grid as a preparation for a physical nuclear strike on U.S. military forces. Uh, in any case, as we reviewed, the primary threat to people's safety in any kind of major crisis, not something that's local like an earthquake in California where you can get other resources from the rest of the nation to help rebuild, but when the whole grid is down and you can't depend on anything but what you've stored or stockpiled, your primary threat is population density, that is too many people around you that have no degree of self-sufficiency and that are going to be panicking and turning to pillaging and various degrees of social unrest. And so we talked about the fact that it's important if you live, as most people do, in high density metropolitan areas that you make at least a strategic move to the outskirts of those areas so that if you do even have a plan to move to a, a more safer retreat with friends or family or your own vacation cabin, that you're not having to plow through a, a world of humanity in order to get there on clogged freeways, as the hurricane in Katrina taught everyone. Um, and so living in the suburban and rural areas next to the suburban areas makes for a reasonable commute, generally, unless you're in the LA basin area where it takes four hours to drive across the, you know, the, the urban area. Those are really no-go zones in my book, Strategic Relocation. But in most moderate metropolitan areas, you can live at the periphery, commute to your job, and, um, and uh, either prepare for some degree of security in your urban residence or be able to retreat to a more secure area elsewhere. The key elements of a secure home in a suburban area, and by the way, I might say, that the degree of security that you need increases the closer you get to a suburban area. The degree of security that you need, the further away from humanity that you get, decreases. But the cost of living and commuting and, and doing what you need to do in life increase as the more rural that you get. I mean, some people say, well, Joel, just tell me where the safest place in the United States is. And I can say, well, it's probably out in the middle of the Nevada desert where you can't make a living and you can't meet him and you don't have Home Depot or any food stores. That's the safest place because there's no people to threaten you. So you see, strategic design of where you're going to live is a compromise always between how you've got to live, what your family and medical needs are. Within that context, most people that I've dealt with over the years are going to stay in a semi-suburban area where it's going to be a compromise. 
So you're going to need a significant amount of security and self-sufficiency if I'm right about the threats to the eventual grid someday in a war type scenario where an EMP attack will be used. And so the proper secure home, first of all, looks like a conventional home. In other words, it doesn't look like a fortress. It doesn't look like the LA Borg cube, which everybody knows is paper thin and because it's you know, all over the YouTube. You want something that looks completely conventional, but you want to have two major aspects in there in the long term. One, you want to have a secure room, a safe concealed room, hopefully in a basement area. And that means if you're going to relocate within a suburban area, you want to pick an area that has basements. Some areas of the country have more basements than others. In California, for example, they don't do basements, not because they really can't, because there's hard, compact soil. Some places in Texas and Arizona, there's hard, compact soil that they, you know, it's very, very hard for an excavator to dig. So they just say, we don't do basements. It doesn't mean that you can't do a basement. If you do a high security room above ground, as you have to do in Florida or places where there's uh, high water tables, you can do that, but it's very difficult, short of a 6,000 square foot mansion, to conceal it. In a big house, yes, you can conceal a room by the way that you plant it so that you walk around the house through the maze of corridors and you can't tell where you are or, or maintain a sense of what's behind each wall. But in a small suburban home, it's very difficult to do that. So that's why I really recommend number one priority in relocation for the physical layout of the home is to provide for basement space. You want that concealed room. If nothing else, not only for fallout resistance in the case of a nuclear war, but so that you don't have to confront people in a social unrest situation. You want an, a, an option where you can retreat behind heavily reinforced room that people can't get to you, that you don't have to confront people. The other thing you need, of course, in that suburban residence is pretty good self-sufficiency because there's not going to be electricity in an EMP strike, for example. And by the way, as I may have mentioned in the previous interview, forget about Iran or North Korea running an EMP strike. It takes six high-altitude nuclear weapons to take down the U.S. grid. You can damage it temporarily with one or two, but really takes six to take down the grid in any significant way so that the rest of the country can't help you rebuild the grid quickly. In a true EMP strike, which only Russia and China have the capability of doing, the grid will probably be down for a minimum of two months and most likely six months because of the shortage of equipment to rebuild the grid after all of the safety components are blown out uh, through the high-powered uh, EMP strike. It only takes three days for people to start to pillage because the grocery stores are empty. And that doesn't mean everyone's going to start there. A lot of good people will not. But when people start to pillage their homes, they're suddenly refugees flowing with the rest of people, and it's unpredictable how people will react in those circumstances. In terms of... This other component that you need besides security in the home is self-sufficiency. And one of the best ways to get that in a long-term area is by using solar in combination with generators. And the reason I say in combination with generators is because solar energy itself to be completely self-sufficient with air conditioning and everything is going to take a huge amount of panels, multiple inverters, and a huge battery bank because air conditioning and refrigeration are the two most uh, taxing features, as any homesteader can tell you. You try to put refrigeration on a solar system and suddenly uh, the batteries start copping out on you and your generators, inverters, etc. So using a combination of a solar panel system that's designed to take, I would say, 50% of your normal electrical load. Uh, capacity. For example, if you've got a 200 amp home, you want a solar system that's going to provide you probably 100 amps. And even 50 to 75 can make it in a, in, a, um, in a pinch. But to go to 200 amps in a solar system is really huge. For example, most inverters only handle 50 amps. And so you've got to piggyback three or four inverters together at four or $5,000 a piece in order to handle that much amperage. And then you've got to have a battery bank commensurately big enough to handle that kind of amperage, which is huge. We're talking about 
you know, twenty to thirty thousand uh, dollars for the solar panels, for that much for the battery bank, and even more if you're going to go with the newest type of batteries, which we can discuss. So, if you combine a solar system that handles your electricity for most of the day when you're doing your ordinary things. And then if you need air conditioning, absolutely, you can turn on the generator to supply that. The problem with the generator, and people say, why not use the generator all the time, is it burns a lot of fuel. For example, a large whole house generator of maybe 15 to 20 kilowatts mm -hmm. is going to burn you about five gallons an hour. Think how much fuel you're going to have to store to burn five, dollar, five gallons an hour. A lot of fuel. If people are on natural gas, they may say I have an unlimited fuel supply, but in an earthquake scenario or even an EMP where you won't be able to have electric pumps that put pressure into that natural gas, you may lose those natural gas supplies. If you use propane, the largest propane tanks on the market today are, are 1,000 gallons. You normally bury these tanks, but they only hold 800 gallons. And at five gallons an hour, uh, you're not going to, you know, that propane's not going to last. And without electricity, it's going to be hard to get resupplied. I prefer diesel for generators uh, in almost all systems because you can store an awful lot of diesel fuel and it doesn't go bad like gasoline. And if you do run out, you can resupply by hand. It may not be convenient, but you can truck down to a normal truck stop if they're running or any other place or farmers who may be willing to sell you some excess diesel and you can resupply by hand, which you can't do with propane. Uh, gasoline is a problem because it's difficult to store. It's volatile. It goes bad uh, after a couple of years. Now, it doesn't mean that it really can't be used after a couple of years. If you can find a little bit of fresh gas to mix in with gasoline, you can keep those things running uh, for longer. But the problem with most gasoline storage tanks is that the code requires that you vent it to the outside. So it's constantly outgassing and getting more concentrated. And you have varnishes that, uh, that accumulate uh, in, the, in the, gas, the old gasoline. And as you burn that in a carburetor system like a generator has, it plugs up those carburetors fairly shortly. So that's one of the reasons why you want to use an additive if you're going to store uh, gasoline that keeps those varnishes from, uh, from forming. But I like to develop a system, as I say, where the solar system handles about half the load and then use a generator to tie into the system when the loads exceed what the solar can handle. Now, in order to do that, you have to have some automatic control equipment that will sense when the solar is going down and when the generator needs to start up. You can do it manually, but if you're not at home, your refrigeration may go bad and other things if, if you don't have some automatic equipment. There's something else in the solar uh, world now that is new on the market, and it's hard to get in the United States. This is called self-consumption. Now, typically, if you ask a solar installer, does your system do self-consumption, he'll say yes. But he's talking about the old-style self-consumption. New-style self-consumption is, well, let me describe the old-style first. Please. Old style cells consumption is when you, whether or not you have a tie in with the grid or not to your solar system, you have a battery bank that is going to give you power if the solar system go, or if the uh, grid tie goes down. The problem with the old style self consumption is that all the times that the solar panels are producing energy, they're pumping energy either into the grid, if you're grid tied, or into your battery bank. And if the grid goes down, everything you get from the solar system has to come through the battery bank and not the solar panels. Solar panels uh, can be, I mean, the sun can be shining heavily, but all that energy from the solar panels and the old style systems going into the batteries, not your grid and everything you're using. So you can see that in an off-grid situation, you're going to really be using up those solar batteries because the, uh, they're going to be discharging. The solar is going to have to recharge in the next day. They're going to be discharging and recharging. In the new type of self-consumption developed by SMA in Germany, you can divert power directly from the solar panels, which have their inverters built into the panels. That's the newest way to do it. Directly into your house panels. 
without going through the solar batteries. So that as long as that sun is shining, you don't have to be tapping in for the batteries. You get, first of all, 100% priority goes to the solar panels and only when they are not producing enough and you're demanding more than what they can give, do you take from the battery. Isn't that interesting? Yep. So the battery, is, in that case, is the last resort, not the not the, nest, not the first, first channel. Yep. Okay. That's correct. And so your batteries last a lot longer when you have these self-consumption inverters. Now, there's currently in the United States only two uh, self-consumption, not in the United States, the SMA of Germany, and they are not importing the self-consumption inverters into the United States yet. And you may say, why? The reason the SMA developed this in Germany is that the they had so much solar energy developed in Germany that they got rid of the subsidies. So there was no longer beneficial to, to use your energy to sell back to the grid and then buy it back what you used. That's what happens in the United States. When you're grid tied, you sell everything from your inverters or from your solar panels to the grid and then you buy back at a higher price, at a retail price. You sell to them wholesale mm -hmm. and you buy back at a retail price. So it's not a good deal. But in Germany, where they cut out the subsidies, the people said, look, we don't need to sell back to the government anymore. I want to use the energy directly for my solar panel. So SMA complied with the type of inverter that does that. It's pretty sophisticated to be able to sense. And what it does during good times, and this is really unique, every time the sun is shining, you're using 100% of that energy into your house or if you don't need it all, you're putting it into batteries. And if you don't need it in the batteries, then you send it to the grid last, not first. Right. And when you're drawing, you can set up the inverters so that you draw first from your solar panels, which is the way it's always done. And if you need more, you draw from the grid, not from your battery. Or you can switch it. If you need more, you draw from the battery and last resort to the grid. So you see these inverters really allow you to manage your consumption to take maximum advantage of the sun that's shining. Now, they're not importing those, SMA says, into the United States because we have so many subsidies. They don't think it's going to sell, and it probably wouldn't. There'd probably just be a few of us hardline solar guys that want to pay for these inverters, but it's not enough for them to market. But PICA Energy Systems in the United States does have a self-consumption inverter. PICA, how do you spell that? P-I-K-A, okay. PICA Energy Systems. But we're not there yet because PICA Energy System only allows self-consumption when you're tied to the grid. Ah. So when you're tied to the grid, yeah, you can get power from the sun directly to anything, but when the grid's off, you can't do that. You gotta go through the old self-consumption of everything through your batteries. Ah. So it's not quite there yet. In addition, there are two other things, or two or three other things that you need, and I've compiled a list in my book, The Secure Home, where I discuss, about, discuss all of these new uh, technologies. Here are the five things that you really want in a solar system. Number one, you want the capability of tying to the grid or acting off-grid. And believe it or not, not all the systems do that. A lot of your big, high-selling solar systems do not act off-grid. Number two, and this is where some solar systems like Pika Energy fails, you want two AC inputs to the inverter. In other words, you want the grid. Naturally, the inverter always takes from the solar panel, but you want AC inputs from the grid and you want AC inputs from a generator. And not all inverters allow you to hook up a generator so that you can replace the grid if you want to. Number three, you want an internal high amperage battery charger with two or three stages of charging capable of charging flooded acid batteries, gel cells, AGM batteries, or the new lithium ion batteries. And we'll talk about battery technology. But believe it or not, a lot of inverters only have a, a very high power charger that has one stage and it can't be used for lithium ion, for example. It can't be used for AGM or glass mat batteries. So you want to make sure that when you're shopping for an inverter that's got a very sophisticated three-stage battery charging that can handle the newest lithium-ion batteries. Number four, and this is very important, but very few inverters have this. Very few solar systems have this. And the ones that do don't have the other things. And that is 
power diversion to dump excess solar power into water heating or an air-driven fan or an air coil heat exchanger when your batteries are charged full and you don't have any place to put the solar, when your grid is down, for example, you've got to have some place to put that power. I prefer water heating capability because you always need hot water. You can install a couple of 100-gallon water heaters in line with your solar system and just dump that solar power into those water heaters. That's a really good system. And number five is this self -cons new self-consumption capability I'm talking about, the ability to power your house directly from the solar panels without going through the grid or the batteries. So those are the five golden things, and unfortunately nothing in the U.S. has all of those as of this writing. Pika Energy keeps promising that they're going to have off-grid capabilities and those two-generator AC outputs, but because there's so very few people that know all of the things you need, salesmen only sell them on what you, they want you to hear. They don't tell you that it doesn't have two AC inputs. They don't tell you it doesn't have a, a power diversion capability. And so that's one of the things we keep looking for in the, um, in the future. You also need, of course, some automatic starting equipment on the generator. Almost all inverters have a, who have a, a generator input have an automatic starting um, relay in there to uh, start your generator. And you can trigger that either when the grid is down in combination when your battery bank needs it. Uh, there's lots of different options that you can do to trigger those. Well, I've talked for quite a bit on solar. Is there any questions that that brings up in your mind, uh, Dunnigan? Uh, well, um, I, a couple of questions I'd written down were actually back on the, on the security topic, but as long as you're on solar, um, some people, I know Brad Harris from Full Spectrum Survival has talked about, and you mentioned if um, mobs or hungry crowds of people will be milling around trying to find food stores or ways of surviving, aren't you going to be very conspicuous with power in a neighborhood that's, that's gone dark? Uh, and will, won't your solar components be ripe for either, either sabotage or, or, or stealing, just theft, outright uh, people just taking your stuff? Is there any concept about how to be um, less obvious about the fact that you do have power? Certainly generators can make noise. A diesel generator is hard to miss the sound or smell of it. But uh, what are your thoughts about, about sort of operational security regarding having power when others don't? It is a real problem. Um, you know, resentment, could people try to throw rocks at or damage or shoot holes in your solar panels? They won't necessarily disable them completely. But that's one of the reasons why I prefer that solar panels be mounted high on a roof um, where they can be out of reach from people getting to them. Solar panels that are, are pole mounted can easily be sabotaged by other people or wires can be cut, etc., just to be mean or, or mean spirited. Um, generators, I, uh, I try to make sure that they're in an enclosed uh, high security surrounding like uh, a block set of walls. It usually has to have significant openings to allow the generator exhaust. I don't recommend generators in the high security portions of the basement. I have done that, designed that into a couple of homes, but it's very difficult getting the heating and cooling and getting the exhaust out. Sometimes we run exhaust from a generator if we want a completely soundproof system. We use a special Portland Hapco exhaust, which is nearly silent, and you can run it up through a chimney, and you can't hear it at all if the generator is in a fairly soundproof room. You can do that in a garage with foam-type soundproofing around a block, high-density wall. It does increase the cost of an insulation, uh, installation a lot. But if you're in a, an insecure area where these are a real problem, mm -hmm. you might have to go to that expense. But my general experience with people is that Sadly, you can't, you can't prepare for every contingency. Some things are just too expensive. And it's better to have something rather than nothing. And, you know, I'm a believer in God. I think if you live well and you make plans to help other people and share as much as you can, that you're going to get some blessings and protection. It isn't guaranteed, of course, as anything in the divine realm. But I just want to make sure people don't get discouraged because they can't afford everything I know how to do. Because even the people who can, and I've had a couple of clients that the sky is the limit financially, 
but they're at a disadvantage because rarely do they know how or are willing to learn how to repair or operate the machinery. And I'm not going to be available by phone when they when they need me most, and neither will repairmen. So having all the money in the world doesn't solve all of the preparedness problems. A couple of questions that occurred to me back when you were talking about uh, the high security and the home location and everything. Um, you mentioned... Uh, for example, LA, where it's miles, it's hours across uh, the metro area. So there's most of the areas within that uh, urban area would be extremely difficult to to uh, um, relieve from. In the case if everybody else wanted to leave, you'd be you'd be caught in a sea of people. Um, what about shore retreat via water, uh, via boat or whatever? There, I've heard that. Uh, like Florida, for example, has 9,000 miles of coastline if you count all the barrier islands and everything. So some people live close to the water rather than trying to get in those clogged freeways and go across land. If someone has a boat, does that make any sense? Are there any scenarios there that actually play out well? They do, actually. And I've advised several clients, one in New York City in Manhattan, for example, who it was impossible to get out uh, except by air or water in a, in a safe, timely manner. And he rented a sailboat slip down in Manhattan, which was within walking distance of his apartment near Central Park. Uh, it was had a security fence and guard on it so that he was reasonably sure that he could get there and uh, could take off on a sailboat that was well stocked continually with a generator, of course, and a solar and a radio and lots of food supplies. I think that's a fairly good option. In terms of a long term scenario, the problem with the sailboat option is piracy mm -hmm. and other predators that, in a long term option, realize that a sailboat can't run away. And once you're discovered and once they target you, it's very, very difficult to survive uh, if you're targeted by pirates or government or other, you know, things in a boat. Now, you can have a fast cigarette boat that can outrun most of these things, but then your fuel is limited and, uh, and that takes a lot of money. The sailboat option is actually the most economical and feasible for most people, but they should realize that it isn't totally secure because especially if you sail down towards the Caribbean and the Latin American countries, they're going to be under a tremendous amount of social unrest as well. And piracy is a way of life down there as it used to be in the 1800s. There's a lot of people who will prey upon uh, you know, wealthy sailboat uh, type people. It's even a problem today, piracy uh, in the Caribbean for mm. expats who are sailing around. So I just want to put those caveats uh, out there that uh, you and, and unfortunately, most of the countries don't allow you to come into port with a gun on board. Uh, there's a real no gun mentality in most of these Latin American countries, but you should have one anyway and conceal it well so that it can't be found if your boat is searched. But you don't want to be out there on the water in a slow moving sailboat without some type of protection in at least you know, have a, a whole bevy of flare guns that you can use a flare gun as a pistol because that's legal to have on a sailboat. Makes sense. Uh, I think if, if anybody has seen uh, Captain Phillips' movie, that, that will come in, in mind as well. Um, you know, you made me smile when you talked about uh, the piracy being a way of life still in the Caribbean. We had the opportunity, my wife and I, of traveling to Bermuda recently for the first time, and that was just really a remarkable experience. But we learned about the history of Bermuda, and it was, that was officially their, one of their first industries there was piracy, and it went together with shipbuilding. They would rebuild the ships of, the, of the, those that they had stolen and uh, became very wealthy through that process. But um, another question on security. Uh, I also have heard uh, com sort of criticism from others in response to uh, guests that we may have had on talking about high security home design, that sort of thing, saying that that a fire is a tremendously uh, lethal uh, disturbance in, in the in the hands of a mob or whatever, that it doesn't take a lot to, to, to basically throw a Molotov cocktail in through your window or something, and there go all your carefully laid plans and all your stockpiles of everything in your house. Uh, what's your thought about uh, reducing your vulnerability to fire? First of all, there's a multiple ways to approach this. Um, at its basic, this is one of the prime reasons why having a, uh, a secure room in a basement that's made out of concrete materials, because that makes it fireproof, is so important because it can survive, properly designed, it can survive a whole house burned down around you. In other words, you can get into that safe room, it's got its own air supply, which you can cut off, by the way, 
to make sure that no air infiltrates. And then your escape tunnel or chamber that you use can be drawn air from outside the house uh, to provide. And you also have uh, respirators inside so that even if it gets smoke filled, you can breathe. Even with a paint, a cheap paint respirator, $35 Home Depot paint respirator will handle up to an hour and a half of breathing smoky air. Hmm. So it doesn't have to be a gas mask. Gas mask, of course, does it for a longer period of time, but even a paint grade respirator from Home Depot will do that. Hmm. I recommend, for example, that everyone have those by each bedside so that in a fire in a home, hmm especially parents, if you want to rescue your children, you can don that respirator and go through the house uh, and, and survive the smoke, which is the major problem at the incip uh, incipient to a fire. Now, in terms of, there are ways which we can fireproof homes, which we do, especially for uh, standalone retreats in a forested area where forest fires can come and destroy it. We like to see fireproof, like, uh, you know, siding on the side, and that can either be aluminum siding or it can be hardy board. Hardy board is a concrete type shingle that looks very much like wood, but is fireproof. You can use aluminum soffits and other things to really make your house fire resistant. You can even put sprinkling systems on the roof, for example, to put a spray of water on the roof so that embers lighting on the roof, you know, will not cause that. But ultimately, against the Molotov cocktail type of scenario, the only defense against that is to have shatterproof windows, which you can use by putting shatter guard on the inside of regular glass windows. So if it throws, it doesn't go through the window. The flames are on the outside. If you have fireproof siding, it will withstand that. Or having some type of shutter system, which uh, is initially non-flammable, either aluminum or even PVC shutters, um, if the Molotov falls down low enough, it won't ignite a PVC uh, shutter. Those are all more expensive options, and most people can't afford those. Uh, shuttering a window and even shutter guard is about $800 window. Shuttering with rolling shutters is about $1,000 to $1,200 a window. So uh, that is an option that isn't an option that everyone uh, can afford. But those are the ways which we handle this, uh, this type of thing. But ultimately, everyone should be able to afford a do-it-yourself concealed safe room in a basement. We put out the book, the High Security Shelter Book, which teaches people how to do it yourself. And the only way to really get complete privacy about knowing about that security room is to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So even though if you say, I don't do do-it-yourself, you should, because you need to have the ability to at least repair everything that you have in that shelter. You want to have, and I'm speaking of solar, you don't want to use your normal solar system for powering your safe room. You want to have your own battery pack, just three or four small batteries in there that will give you a couple of weeks of power for your ventilation and your lights. You don't want to live in a dark cube. You, know, you want to have the power that can't be caught, uh, sabotaged even in a fire within that safe room. Back to the topic of uh, high security shelter. Um, what about um, surveillance uh, systems? We we saw. Uh, I was I was shocked to see a a article. Uh, it's been a few years now, but it was that the San Diego Police Department was inviting residents who had uh, video camera surveillance systems installed in their home to allow the police to tap into their system to help monitor their home when they're on vacation, when they're at work, that sort of thing. Or if there's if there's a burglar kind of a loose in the neighborhood, then they could keep an eye on them as you move from, from home to home, that sort of thing. Um, but that sort of uh, at surrendering your privacy to the authorities in, in the name of increasing your security, I guess what your thoughts are on these and there's now it's low, costs have come down. You see ads every every month on TV. It's it's cheaper and cheaper systems that you can install yourself. So could you give us your thoughts on uh, surveillance technology for your own dwelling? Well, San Diego was following the London model where you have cameras everywhere and uh, you have software that integrates all of them. They can literally follow someone along every street in London and, and find out where they're going. Yeah, nice for police, but very bad for privacy and very. You know, good for the deep state, but not good, you know, for the individual who simply wants to not be observed. The problem with tapping into your personal security systems, though, is your private life, you know, is at risk as well within the home. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the problems with the new brand of security systems, they're all wireless. That's the way you get cheap security systems. Yep. 
And so they've got to have, you want to make sure if you get a wireless system, you can't get the low end systems that don't have encryption on that wireless. You want to make sure you get enough that you get encryption. And even the encryption wireless systems are coming down. But especially when you're talking about cameras, you also want to make sure that you have a very good password on the internet connection to your security system so that government can't tap into that. And, um, um, and unfortunately, some of your major systems may have backdoors for government so that even when you don't know it, they can tap into your security system. So you don't necessarily want to go with the biggest names in security who may have made this secret deal with government. And we found out years ago that you know, Facebook and Google had backdoors to everything. The Microsoft had backdoors for Windows 10, uh, so that it really isn't secure anymore. Got to really be careful of this insider government corporate relationship that we're dealing with. You know, that, that's another thing that we just heard recently, um, and I don't remember which brand it was, whether it was Alexa or which of these devices uh, in home, but one of these smart speaker devices that people will put in their home, and they did. They found out that, oh, it's listening all the time, even before you ask it to do something, and they said, well, you can shut that, that, uh, that mode off so that it shouldn't be storing your recent uh, conversations up at the server level, and they found out that even when you do shut that off, it's still recording it up at the server level. <laughs> So it's it's always listening, and and your uh, activity in your home is always being recorded uh, up at the up at the mothership. So that is a real it's a serious concern for the people who want to increase their security without losing their privacy. Well, it is, and smartphones are a problem too because smartphones can be turned on to be used as listening devices as well. And that's why I still carry a a non-smartphone uh, for times when I want to be uh, you know private and to make sure that I'm not tracked. And of course, you have to remove the battery if you don't want that phone location to be tracked uh, where you go. So you have to learn some things. I caution people about trying to be super private so that it raises red flags. You know, if you suddenly disappear, then the government wants to know where you went. And uh, you don't want to try to get too many, or I don't really like getting a lot of foreign passports that raises red flags. And you don't want to get on these lists of people that the government wants to surveil because of suspicious activity. That's the concept you're talking about of being becoming the gray man. Um, are yes. there are there any specific uh, points there that are your favorite ones to talk about that people, if they really want to keep uh, a low profile, uh, but not so low that it becomes conspicuous by how low it is? Right. The key is to maintain what I call a normal profile while you establish a more private profile. As long as you maintain the normal one, all the fingers of government. So for example, if you get a high security retreat somewhere that you really want to keep private, you don't put it in your own name, you have it in an LLC or other th types of things, and you keep a normal, even if it's an apartment, or even if it's a friend who decides to be a mail drop for you. So your IRS letters come there. You, you've got a telephone in your name there. You've got all kinds of things that point to a normal place that you do not exist at, or at least that you're not there all the time. That's a very important strategy that very few of the privacy experts talk about. You know, you can go to all kinds of very expensive ways to hide yourself. But I think that in today's surveillance society where the NSA captures everything, including all your bank and transaction records. You want to make sure your credit cards look normal. You want to make sure that uh, you keep buying things back in that normal spot so that all the records point to the fact that you live there and you don't want to be there, of course, when they may come to pick you up someday. Well, Joel, uh, so we've covered uh, high security shelters, uh, solar self-sufficiency, and uh, becoming the gray man and I've written down a whole bunch of notes for myself I bet a lot of our viewers too about having having the uh, paint respirators near each bedside in the house that's something I remember in fire safety they talked a, a lot of tips about that but they didn't mention that one that's a very good one um, any final thought from anything we've talked about that you'd like to leave with our viewers before we before we let you go I might also mention just on that particular subject I always keep a respirator in the trunk of my car too there have been a lot of times out west where roads get closed oh, yeah. because there's blowing smoke and in California where you you get trapped they won't let you go forward you can't go back and you're getting inundated with smoke what do you do jump out of the car get that respirator out of your trunk and put it on 
That's the way to handle. So you should always have those respirators. And they're cheap enough that you can have them in any location. You don't have to carry carry them with you. Had a good family acquaintance that actually was the uh, best man at my brother's wedding and uh, wasn't able to make it because of the uh, Mount St. Helens eruption in Washington. Mm -hmm. And it was the dust. It was just the windblown dust that was choking out the air filters and the cars that was stranding right. cars right and left. And he said those people who had spare air filters, believe it or not, were the ones who could keep moving when others were, were stranded. So um, there's sometimes it's the, it's the human people that need the air filter and sometimes it's the vehicle. So. Well, there's another trick there that your listeners need to remember too. If you get in a, a place, and I was there uh, some 30, 40 miles from Mount St. Helens. Fortunately, most of the ash was going north. and But on a couple of days in Hood River, Oregon, where I was living, we did get ash. And so one of the tricks that I learned was you know how to open up your air filter. It's very simple. A couple of clips, open it up, pull it out, and bump it on the ground and shake that dust out, put it back, and you're good to go for yep. another hour. Yep. And so a lot of people don't realize you don't have to replace the air filter. You can bump it on the ground and shake it out, get that dust out of there, and keep going. So there's a lot of little tricks that people need to know of how to survive. It's especially important... If people are planning on getting on the road in any crisis, they make sure that their car is equipped with extra parts and uh, extra fuel should always have in the trunk. Even though the experts say, don't do it, it's dangerous, I always have some extra fuel so that I do. If you run into these cases where the miles long at the gas stations, you, you're going to run out of fuel before you get to the gas pump, just keep going with that. And in, in a real, when I'm really anticipating a crisis, if I'm in an urban area, I want to make sure I have got one of these small pullable folding bicycles in the trunk of the car. I can abandon that car and take off and nobody can stop me if I'm in shape and I can get to where I'm going with, with a bicycle. Lots of little things like that. Another interesting thing for those of people who are capable of learning how to fly is that being a pilot sometimes and having an airplane at an uncontrolled airport where you don't require the permission of the tower to take off, you can leapfrog over social and urban unrest where it's unsafe to get someplace in a car if you get a pilot's license. And there's a lot of, of flight schools now that are just dying for business because it's generally too expensive for most people to fly for about a five to $6,000. You can learn to fly and rent a plane or buy one jointly with people, you can get planes for as low as $20,000 that are capable cross-country airplanes now. That's less than what most cars cost. Huh. So people need to think outside the box sometimes about how to solve problems. If you have to stay within the D.C. area or the New York area, think about locating next to an uncontrolled airport. There's lots of little mom-and-pop airports around the world that can provide a, a leap to safety for people. Well, Joe, you've got, given us a lot to think about, and uh, I get the feeling we've just scratched the surface on a number of these topics again. Uh, we didn't even get back to deeper diving on the strategic relocation, so we'll, do, we'll, we'll circle back on that next time we we're able to have you on, and just uh, very grateful for you uh, joining us here again on Reluctant Preppers. My pleasure to be with you. You've got a good group, Donegan. Thank you. They say the stock market crashed today. Yeah. I heard that. Sounds like people's retirement accounts and savings accounts are going to get bailed into the banks. Yeah. Looks like pension plans and social security are going to get suspended too. I know. Sure, I'm glad we decided to put our money into gold and silver instead. Me too. Get your gold and silver and support this channel at goldsilver.com slash question mark AFF equals RP. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctant preppers.